So, hi, I'm Stefan. Um, this weird letter in my last name is a clear indicator that I'm from Germany. Uh, correctly pronounced, my last name is Hochdefer, which <laughs> is music to my ears. Um, however, there's no need for you to try to pronounce that. It's okay if you call me Stefan, it's even better if you just call me Steve, so I'm just giving you options. Um, turns out I do a lot of public speaking over the last couple of years. If I don't do that, I run my own uh, company. The company is called BitExpert. We are a technology company and located in Mannheim, Germany. My current role with the company is head of technology, which is as awesome as it may sound to you. Um, this means for us that I'm on the one hand a kind of an internal consultant for our project teams, um, trying to get new technology knowledge into the project teams, and on the other hand, um, trying to solve technical issues that we may have, which doesn't happen as often as you may think, for sure. Um, if I'm not doing that, I'm running our educational program, um, running trainings, running workshops, I'm hosting and co-organizing our yearly developer conference, I'm hosting and co-organizing our public unconference called the Unconf, which will happen in April. So if you're close to Mannheim, just ping me, maybe I can sneak you in somehow. Um, if I'm not doing that, uh, I'm actually co-hosting two PHP user groups. One is the PHP user group in Frankfurt, and the other one is the PHP user group Metropolregion Rhein-Neckar. As you can see, I'm from Germany. We have very long names. Um, so that's just like the outer Mannheim region. Okay. If you do have any questions concerning this talk, feel free to ask them at the end, um, or grab me in the hallway. If, however, you don't like to talk to a German public, or you are scared of doing so, which is something I can fully understand, I'm scared of talking to myself a lot of times, um, just send me an email, ping me on Twitter and whatnot. I like you guys in the front. <laughs> this gets... Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, okay, let's get started. So, just to give you a bit of context, a bit of background knowledge. Um, so, BitExpert, I said it, we are a technology company focusing on web and, and mobile technologies, um, meaning that we do use a lot of different technologies. We use PHP for most of our projects, but we also use Java. We use a tons of data stores, MySQL, Postgres, uh, MongoDB, Neo4j, whatnot. Uh, we use Node.js, we use Apache, uh, Nginx, HAProxy, different kind of PHP frameworks. You get the theme, right? Um, so there's a lot of stuff involved, um, which makes it not really, really easy for our developers to get started on a new project or when they take over an existing one to get everything up and running. And about five years ago, we had one of those projects where we threw in a new development team, three or four guys, three of them could set up the project um, quite quickly, and like the, other, the, the last guy in the team, it took him like about two days or so to get started. Um, I heard about that and I got really sad. I mean like really sad. Um, because it means we lost a shitload of money, like me as a company owner, right? And that makes me really sad. Um, so I thought we need to change that, right? We need to make development fun again and um, making it really easy for, for our developers to get in a project um, over time. And turns out, like five or six years ago, when you were at the PHP conference, you heard about Vagrant, you heard about Puppet and all that stuff, and I thought, well, that may be a good, good way to go. So let's see what, what those tools can, can offer us. <clears throat> so the idea was really um, to have a really isolated uh, development environment, um, as little host installs as possible, so having a VM or something like that, um, where all the stuff is, is installed in. Um, and ultimately, I wanted to find a way to at least make it possible that we could do something like continuous deployment. Um, technically, we can. Practically, we will never do. Um, since we are an agency, um, well, for us, it's important to have an approval of the client. And for the client, it's important to, <laughs> to give, us, give us an approval. But, well, technically, we can do that. Um, in the end, someone needs like, to push the red or green button or whatnot um, to make that stuff go to production. So what are the challenges I'm, I'm trying to face with this talk? Well, first of all, how do we deal with dependencies? And I'm not only focusing on like composer dependencies, but also system dependencies, PHP extensions, uh, any services that need to be installed uh, somewhere, um, maybe CLI applications that need to be there because your application needs to invoke them, um, all sorts of stuff. Um, how do we deal with database schema changes? Who of you is using a relational database? 
Oh yeah. You like schema migrations? <laughs> a lot, right? That, that's really a pain in the ass. Um, so I'll show you how we do that. Um, and how do we isolate development environments? As I said, we are, we are doing a lot of projects, so our developers have or work on, on different projects, well, not the same time, but in parallel. Um, so we need a way to, to distinguish or to isolate between these environments uh, to make sure that, that there are no problems coming up. And ultimately, at least when I started to think about this, I wanted to figure out a way of hiding all that complexity from my developers. They should not really care what we are doing. Um, technically, this was a good idea. Practically, I completely failed. Um, and I completely changed my mind when it comes to that point. Um, thing is, we are using a lot of tools, we are downloading um, OS packages, we are downloading composer packages, we are, we are downloading puppet modules, so we are relying a lot of external services um, that we can't control, and chances are things can go bad quite often. And tell you what, they do. Um, and if we, would f if we would have followed the rule, um, the people or my developers would come to me and say, hey, we've got a problem, figure it out. Um, this turns me to the bottleneck, which is probably not the best idea, because I really am uh, the bottleneck of my company in some situations. Um, so the goal is to do this the other way around and say, hey, developers, these are the tools that we are using and educating them how to use them so they at least technically can fix the issues themselves. <clears throat> Um, so, okay, so the, the basic idea was really to find a solution that more or less looks like this. So you clone the repo, and then you just type Vagrant up, and everything magically works. Which sometimes really happens. <clears throat> so great, so Vagrant, who's using Vagrant? Okay, great, so I don't need to tell much about it. So it's basically a tool for, for setting up development environments. Um, it's pretty old, actually, I just realized. It came to light in 2010, uh, which is like six years ago. Gosh. Um, and last year, the company behind Vagrant announced the successor called Otto. It's currently still in development. Um, seems to be even more awesome than, than Vagrant is, so you need less of configuration. It magically figures out what you're dealing with and then just does something. <clears throat> Whatever. Um, right. So the benefits of Reagan. Um, we got an environment per project, so we have really this, this isolation that is really important for us. Uh, it's versionable because it's just a simple text file, so I can check it into Git and, and push it and uh, share it across the team, so one developer makes a change, everybody uh, gets the changes. Um, and finally, we can get around the works on my machine excuse, right? Well, technically. Um, it turns out sometimes with Reagan and Puppet, it works for one developer, but not the others for whatever reason. So this is not completely true, but we are getting quite close that it works the same all over the place. <clears throat> Great. And this is especially important for us. Um, currently, we have developers using Linux, we have developers using Macs, we have developers using Windows, and we need a consistent environment that works across all of the machines, um, which is really important if you use tools like Gearman, for example, um, which simply cannot be compiled on Windows. So in the past, uh, we had the pain of setting up a separate virtual machine for, for the Windows developers just to make them um, able to communicate that. So with Vagrant and Puppet and a lot of stuff, we have it in our virtual environment running on, on the developers' machines, and everything is great, well, mostly. This is how a Vagrant configuration looks like. I guess you're all familiar with that. Uh, we can define a Vagrant file API version, a minimum version that, uh, that is required of Vagrant to run, which is really good if you have developers on your team that don't regularly update um, their, their host installations, um, which, again, can be quite messy because different versions of Vagrant work slightly different in some edge cases. And then you simply define your virtual machines. Like in this case, it's a Debian Jesse box um, with the hostname my host and the, exposing the current folder as slash vagrant in the machine. To run vagrant, you all know that, just type vagrant up, and you've got a bunch of, of um, comments showing what vagrant's doing, downloading the base box, configuring the networking, configuring port forwarding, uh, mounting the folders, and whatnot. And after that, you have your, your uh, virtual machine ready, and you can work with it. <clears throat> now, I just said a couple of times box. Um, 
A box is basically an image that is used to create the virtual machine. Um, there are two ways to obtain such a box. Uh, there is a website called reganbox.es where you just um, can pick any of these boxes that you want. There is an offering by HashiCorp, the company behind Vagrant. It's called atlas.hashicorp.com where you just can also uh, figure out um, which boxes you, you want to use. Uh, pro tip, when you pick a box from there, download it and host it on your, on your own servers. This really killed us the first time we, we tried that. Um, so I configured this project for our teams. We worked for like three or four months. It, everything was fine. And then half a year later, the customer came and said, hey, I want to make a change. So we said, hey, developer, it's a new one. He did not work on the project originally. Um, check out the, the repo, just run Vagrant up, and everything will work magically. Five seconds later, he, the guy is standing in my door. It doesn't work. OK, great. Um, so let's try this. So I checked out the repo, just typed Vagrant up. Everything was working fine. OK, something really weird going on. Um, so I went to the guy. We, we looked at the logs of, of Vagrant. And it turns out Vagrant could not download the base box anymore and just didn't start. OK, I just grabbed the base box from my cache folder, just uploaded it on some of our servers, changed the URL, and then everything worked fine. So host the fucking box on your own. <laughs> Otherwise. Otherwise, you may run into problems. What's pretty cool about Vagrant is that um, Vagrant at least these days supports a lot of providers. Originally, it was shipped with VirtualBox, but now you can run uh, VMware, you can use Hyper-V, you can use KVM, uh, you can also use spin up Docker instances, you can spin up um, any kind of cloud instance, AWS and whatnot. So it's really cool to just need to type Vagrant up, and the magic happens again. Pretty cool. Uh, and you can customize how Vagrant works by, uh, by so-called plugins. Um, there are tons of those. Cache, host manager, librarian, puppet, DNS, whatnot. Um, again, it can be a bit tricky to find a plugin that works on all of the development platforms. So that is a bit, a bit tricky these days. But if you do, it, it, runs, it runs fine. I want to highlight a particular plugin that at least I see that not many people know. It's the Cache plugin. Uh, you simply install it by, by saying Vagrant plugin install Vagrant dash cache. Um, and then you add a bit of configuration code in your, Vagrant, in your Vagrant file. So if the plugin is enabled, just setting a few options. Now, as the name implies, the, the cache plugin is used for caching. Um, when you don't use the plugin and you say Vagrant up, um, Vagrant or Puppet or whatnot would download the OS packages, store them locally in the virtual machine, and when you say Vagrant destroy, all the stuff is gone. You type Vagrant up, and it will download the stuff again. Which, if you have a decent internet connection, is pretty good. If you are in a situation where you have an awesome office but a crappy internet connection, like we do, till March, <laughs> then everything will change. Um, thank you, Deutsche Telekom. Um, you have to be a bit careful uh, what and how much people download. Um, so what this plugin does, it knows about the locations where these packages are located, like APT packages, uh, the Composer packages, NPM packages, and links these directories back to the host. So the files are actually stored on the host. And when you destroy and up the, the box again, uh, the files are there. And when like APT uh, recognizes the package is there, it won't download it anymore, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so in one of the projects where we used it, we, um, we minimized the deployment time from like 20 minutes to five, just by not downloading all the packages. And that is really, really awesome. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so go out and, and use that plugin. That, that's really cool. OK. So for, for configuration management, we use Puppet. There are tons of alternatives out there. Uh, there's Chef, there's Salt, there's Ansible. You could use a simple bash script that does all the stuff. Um, I picked Puppet five years ago, mostly for two reasons. One, it was like at every other PHP conference. Um, and second, most of my speaker friends were using Puppet, so I knew if I run into issues, I know when to ask. Um, so that was the only reason. I'm sorry, Puppet Labs, but that's, that's the truth. Um, so Puppet is, is a, a DSL, a domain-specific language, written in Ruby. Um, that is used to describe what should be done. If you don't want to write Puppet code yourself, there is this, um, I have no idea how to pronounce that, there is this web application called PHPuppet, whatever. Um, 
When I, 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 when I will share the slides, this is actually a link to, to, uh, to the web application, so you don't even need to search for that on Google. <laughs> just making it really easy for you. And um, this is like a web UI, and you just click together what, what your, your box should, uh, should run with, and then you, the Puppet code is magically created, and you just throw it into a virtual box, uh, into Vagrant, and everything will work again. This is how, how a Puppet script looks like. Um, we can define variables, default packages, expect call git, and then there we have a package command where we just pass the array to and say, hey, make sure these packages are present on our box. Um, or we can say, hey, I want a host entry in my host.log, which should point to 127.0.101. Uh, just do it. As you can see, this is very high level. So technically, this works on every platform that Puppet supports. So any kind of Linux distribution um, technically should also work on Windows. Well, probably you can't install tools like Expect and Crawl on Windows, but technically, the possibility is there. So this is what a DSL looks like, right? It don't say what to do, but like uh, how to do it. Um, and to run Puppet, <clears throat> the easiest way is simply to call Puppet Apply and just pass the script that we just created. If we've done that, uh, we get a lot of output, again, which shows, that, shows us exactly what happened. Uh, package curl, ensure, ensure change purge to present. Git, ensure, ensure change purge to present. Just says, hey, just I installed it. Um, and at the bottom, you see the host entry is also created. So that's cool. And this is how a typical project structure in our projects look like. Um, we do have a Puppet folder, uh, which contains all the Puppet configurations the main manifest file, the modules folder, and in the source folder, we just keep the local Puppet configuration to tie everything together. Um, and then we have a Puppet file, which I'll touch upon briefly later. Um, we do have a bootstrapping script in our shells folder, which I'll just cover also pretty quickly, pretty decent. And then we have our source folder, test folder, and the web route. <clears throat> In the beginning, when we started experimenting with, with Puppet, um, whenever we needed a module, we just downloaded it, put it in the modules folder, and we're good to go. This is probably not the best way to do it. Um, however, there's a solution to that, which is called Librarian Puppet. You could say that Librarian Puppet is the composer for Puppet modules, meaning that you can define your dependencies, and then Librarian Puppet will download them and install them in the respective folders. Um, the Puppet file is actually the, the correspondent file to the composer.json file. Uh, you simply point it to the forge. This is like packages for the Puppet modules. Um, then you list all the modules that should be installed, example 42 Apache, example 42 PHP, and so on and so forth. Define the version numbers. Or you could say, hey, I have this module customer one dash project one, and this is located like relatively to the Puppet file. Um, to the Puppet file. And then Puppet, uh, Librarian Puppet will just either download all these modules or copy uh, the customer one dash project one folder over in this modules folder, and then um, everything is ready so that Puppet can run. <clears throat> and it also locks the dependency versions in a Puppet file.log, so similar to the composer.log file. So all the developers theoretically get the same version. <clears throat> right. So to run it, you have to install it, obviously. Um, it's, it's a gem package, so it's simply called gem install librarian puppet, and then you can either say librarian puppet install or update, same as composer install versus composer update. <clears throat> right, um, so how do we hook that into Vagrant? Turns out there is a Vagrant plugin for that, the Vagrant librarian puppet plugin. The downside is, this works perfectly fine on Linux. I couldn't get it to work on Windows. I literally took like two days of trying to get it work and debug Ruby on Windows. It did not work. For some reason, it just did not find the Ruby version or the Puppet version that was installed. That was really, really bad. So after the two days, I was really annoyed. I was really sad that I wasted again two, two days. Um, I Googled a bit and I found a solution. Um, that's why we use the shell script. So in fact, we use shell script provisioning and that will then run in the virtual machine and everything is working fine. Um, the downside of the librarian, of the Vagrant librarian plugin is also it would run on the host, which to me doesn't make any sense at all because I want to configure that stuff in the virtual machine, um, which just works perfectly fine with the, the shell script version. So we call the 
our bootstrap script, pass a few parameters, like where, where the puppet module is located, which file to execute, and that's it. And this is a really, really stripped down version of, of what our bootstrapping script looks like. So we grab the input parameters, we try to install librarian puppet if it's not installed, run install or update, and then just simply run the puppet apply command. That's it. Um, great. What we also run in our puppet run is composer. Who of you has heard of composer? I want to see all hands up. Uh, almost. Okay, cool. <clears throat> great. So, um, yeah, we use Composer for all the dependency management. Um, to run Composer via Puppet, we need a few packages. Obviously, we need curl, we need git, and, and PHP 7 and CLI, because no one installs PHP 5 anymore. <laughs> I actually changed the slides yesterday evening <laughs> to make that joke. Um, <laughs> it's all for you guys. Uh, right, so first of all, we grab Composer, we simply curl it uh, like, like you would, put it into user local bin. I know this is probably not the best way to put it because you download anything that you want. Um, in some projects, we also have the Composer file locally and just put it or copy it from the host to, to the uh, correct location on the virtual machine. And then we, uh, we execute Composer. So simply Composer install in our slash vagrant directory. And to do that, we require git, we require PHP 7 CLI, and we require that Composer actually is installed. Um, this worked quite a while. And then one time, for some really weird reason, it just broke. It didn't work. Composer stopped with some really weird error message. And I figured out that I need to pass the environment variable composer underscore home or set that, and since then composer runs again. I have no idea why, but yeah, that's the mystery of life. <clears throat> now, we do work for a lot of customers, and for a lot of customers, we work on a lot of different projects talking to the same services. So we tend to write modules or libraries that, that um, cover that specific functionality. Now what you could do technically is upload these packages to packages and, and share them and then include them. But that does not make sense in some cases. So you might want to host the, the packages on your own. Um, there are actually two options right now. You can u either use Cetis, which is like uh, the old school version of, uh, of the package hosting, or you could use Tor on proxy. Um, I show you how to use Cetis because that is what we use. And I don't feel enough pain to switch to Tor on. That's probably the best way to put it. Um, however, you should use Toran. Uh, you should buy a license so that Jordi is happy and continues developing uh, Toran and Composer. Um, this is what we did, um, even though we use Cetis. Um, yeah, come on, be nice to the people, right? Um, installing Cetis is really simple. Uh, you can co use Composer for that. Simply say create project, composer Cetis, and then you need a configuration file. JSON file, you need to give it a name, you need to give it a home page, and then you just simply list the repositories that should be crawled, um, pass some configuration parameters, and you're good to go. Um, also, pro tip, it's way more efficient if you can run Cetis on the same machine where the Git repos are located, so you can use local URLs, uh, file system URLs, instead of the HTTP ones. Um, that one, the cloning and stuff, runs much faster. Um, and then you simply call Cetis bin set is build, this is the configuration file, and put all the stuff that you create or, or generate in the web folder, and you're good to go. So this is the output. You get a nice little web page uh, listing all the packages that, that are available in Cetis, and you get even the code snippet that you need to paste into your composer.json to talk to Cetis. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, that was not enough for us, because we have to deal with private repositories. Um, we do have a few customers that force us to protect the different projects for different developers. So just the developers that are um, or should work on the projects are, are able to, to access the files, uh, which then in turn means we needed to deal with private repositories. There is an easy solution for that, or that, that's what we use. In most cases, HTTP basic authentication, so we hook up Apache and just connect it to our LDAP server, and that makes it really simple in most cases. Um, 
when Composer will recognize that either status or a repository is protected with HTTP basic authentication, it will ask for username and password. For a long time, Composer was not able to store that, that stuff, which is really annoying, and B, you can't automate it. Well, that's not true, because I'll show you in a second how, but um, just assume that this is the case. Um, so at one point, I was so annoyed, and I was at Kung Fu, I think, three years ago or so. Uh, I was waiting for my flight back home, and I simply d took a deep dive in the Composer sources, and I figured out how to patch that. Well, how to create a pull request out of that. That's probably the best way to put it. Um, so I sent the pull request to Jordi. Uh, it took him a while to completely rewrite that stuff because I <laughs> totally messed it up. And <laughs> um, actually, it, it was missing one important feature that um, the data you input was stored on, on disk. So that was not available in my patch. Um, so luckily, I think since, since two years or so, the, the patch is in and, and you could all use it. Um, this is based on the idea of having an auth.json file either locally in the project or globally in, in your composer at home, which then gets merged, um, and you simply list the usernames and passwords for the different servers. Um, as I said before that, we were in need for a solution to that because I wanted to automate all that stuff. I was talking with a few friends, and one of them uh, introduced me to expect. And if you don't take anything away from this talk, you should this. This is massive. Who of you knows what expect is? OK, quite a few. Basically, you can think of expect as being a remote control for CLI scripts. So I can script CLI script execution. So whenever a CLI script, script asks me a question, expect can like simulate being a user in front of it and inputting that stuff. This is massive. Um, so this is how you could run Composer via expect. So what it does, it spawns a new process, it spawns Composer install, and when Composer asks for username colon, expect will send the string my username enter. If Composer is waiting for you to enter your password, expect will send my password enter. And we do that as long as Composer, uh, or until Composer finally writes generating auto load files because this is the, the final end of, of the Composer script. And that is pretty awesome. Um, so how do we hook that up into our Vagrant and Puppet workflow? Um, I'm a bit scared of showing you the next slide because I think it's a really stupid idea, but it was the easiest way of getting things done. Um, so don't blame me publicly. You can blame me privately for sure. Um, what we do is every developer exposes two environment variables, composer underscore user, composer underscore pass. Um, when Vagrant runs, it will grab the environment variables um, set these local variables over here, and then pass them to the bootstrapping shell script. In the bootstrapping shell script, we do set so-called factor variables, so factor underscore user, factor underscore pass, um, which then are exposed by Puppet in the Puppet run, which means um, we can use the colon colon user and colon colon pass syntax to access the environment variables. So we are getting the environment variables from the host, from the environment variables via Vagrant, via the bootstrapping script, into Puppet, when, uh, runs uh, expect and runs Composer. That was easy, right? Yeah, obvious solution. Um, right, so we do run Composer for our install with that. Um, but only in development mode. We don't run Composer install in production. No one should. Uh, on production, uh, we simply run the dump autoloader with the optimize flag and, and the no dev flag. So that's what we, well, actually, we do that on testing and staging and production, to be, to be correct. Um, so we know as early as possible if, if there are any problems with that. Um, how much time do I have left? Oh, shit, I need to speed up. OK, great. Um, so we do use Fing for anything automation. So this is like our CLI magic script. Um, why thing? Because awesome. Um, I, I'm saying this now. Like 12 years ago, I was totally into Ant. Uh, I couldn't understand why anybody would convert that to thing or, or to PHP. Um, these days, I see completely different. Um, I, I, sh I share you in a second. So thing for us is a kind of domain-specific language. So again, it's it's like uh, it's like the the glue for any third-party tool my developer interacting with. I don't want to remember, or I don't want them to remember all the different command line switches that they have to use to force a different behavior. Um, that is way too annoying for them. They just 
should know, hey, we have a thing target called sniff that runs code sniffer exactly in the way we want to configure it. We run PHP unit exactly in the way we want or we need it. Um, we run different other tools that I just forgotten in exactly the same way that we want. And thing is like the, the, the initial point of contact, so to speak. Why thing? Um, because it runs everywhere where, where it runs everywhere where PHP runs. Um, we don't need anything additional like Java or whatnot, which is quite funny because in a moment I show you a Java tool. Um, uh, it has about 120 predefined tasks that you can use in your scripts, and most importantly for us, uh, it's super easy to write your own tasks. Um, you can write them as a separate composer package and just install them, uh, install them as is. Uh, you can put them into the uh, current project and just um, um, include them in your, in your thing configuration. So that, that's really cool. Uh, to install thing, damn, I forgot to change the slide. We do use composer install, uh, composer require thing, and we don't edit the, the file yourselves. So Raphael, don't blame me on Twitter. Um, uh, right, if we have done that, um, we have in vendor bin thing the, the, uh, the binary, and uh, we can run that. Damn, I, run, I completely ruined this presentation. Um, we do have two configuration files. We have a global build.properties file where we simply just configure different paths and where the executables, executables are or any kind of options. Um, and we do use a local.properties file, um, which is git ignored, where our developers can make some changes if they want to or if they need to, like in this case, providing a username for, for the SSH access. Um, <clears throat> I really need to speed up. Um, you know, this is the, the, thing pro uh, the thing project configuration. Um, this is how we load the build properties file, um, the, the global one. If a local one would exist, um, uh, it would first check if the file is available down, down at the bottom, and then just load the, the local properties file and overwrite the existing settings. So just pretty quickly, so this would be the output if the local.properties file is not available in, in the current uh, folder. Um, if it is, it would simply load it, and you can also see that it was loaded, which is also pretty interesting or pretty good to see um, when you know what's happening. And again, we do run thing via, via Puppet, um, calling like the database migrations, doing cache warming and whatnot. So everything that is needed um, is run via Puppet. So whenever the box is provisioned, we can just work with it. Um, for database migrations, I just said it, we use Liquibase. Um, there are tons of alternatives out there. There's DB Deploy, there is Flyweight, I think, it's, it's a Java tool. Uh, Doctrine migrations and uh, PHP has its own one, it's called Finks. Um, I'm still a big fan of Liquibase. We use it since, I don't know, seven or eight years when none of the other tools existed or were pretty bad. Um, so we just stick with that. I like it. Um, you could either use the XML syntax, which I pretty much like, um, define your change that's there, create tables, modify tables, create indexes, modify indexes, whatnot. Um, the bonus point for, for using XML is that it's database independent, so you can fire that against MySQL, fire that against Postgres, whatnot, which in some cases is really important to do. Uh, this doesn't happen very often to us, but it happened like three or four times, so we were thankful that we had the code abstracted in that way. Um, if you really can't stand seeing XML, um, Liquibase also supports plain SQL, and I think Jamo, I'm not really sure about that one. Um, so you can pick what you like. This is the, the file system layout in our case, so we have a database folder, there's a dev subfolder um, in which the liquibase.xml file resides, and all the change sets um, we outsource in the change sets directory as single files, um, and then include them in the main liquibase file. The change sets have a timestamp, like the day when, when the change set happened, um, a unique number, and um, like an identifier to at least have a rough idea what's going on at the change set. And then to run, to run Liquibase, we simply call thing db update. So things come, thing comes with a few uh, Liquibase tasks that you can use. Um, so this is basically what happens under the hood. We, we call Liquibase, pass the driver, configure the class path, and do some other stuff, and then simply call the migrate task of Liquibase, which will do all the magic involved. Um, right, last but not least, the build server. Um, so since 
four or five years, we are big fans of Jenkins, most of the time. Um, when things go, go good, um, when things break, we don't like Jenkins anymore. Um, but that is, that's, that's a different story, I can tell you. Someone else. Um, and since January, we are using, using GitLab. Um, and this is how it works. So in the GitLab configuration, GitLab, I can configure webhooks similar to, to GitHub, <clears throat> just pointing them to our Jenkins instance and say, hey, whenever an, a push event happens or a tag event happens, just trigger the build. Um, this relies on the GitLab Jenkins plugin, um, which then also can communicate back if the build was successful or not, which is pretty cool. In Jenkins, we have uh, quite a few build nodes. We have generic ones, build node 1 to, to 7, uh, which will run unit tests depending on different configurations, different PHP versions and whatnot. And we have um, build nodes dedicated to single projects for the integration builds. So project-1-int.log down at the bottom is actually a box specifically for project 1 um, where all the integration tests will happen. I could have used the build node and then somehow pushed the files over, but that was way too complicated for me, so uh, we simply created like dedicated build nodes for these projects. To configure such a build node is pretty easy. Give it a name, give it a description, and what we extensively use these days is the labels plugin, where we simply define what exactly is running on that, that build host, like in this case, PHP 5.6, enter command 4, 5, npm, puppet, and nhvm, um, because that dramatically helps when you configure a job. Like in the past, we we use the build node names when we wanted to try to bind a job to a build node, um, which when you have like two or three build nodes is really easy to figure out what version of which software is running on what server. Um, if you have like five or more uh, build nodes up and running, it can be quite messy, um, which brought me to this idea that Jenkins is a very good AI because Jenkins, let me rephrase it. When Jenkins has the possibility to pick any, to pick a specific build server out of a big pool, it will always pick the one where at least one dependency is missing. <laughs> this is true. This is reproducible. I tried it hundreds of times. This, the AI is Damn good. I, I have no idea how they do that. So again, to fix that, I, I figured out how can I do that, and then I saw this labels plugin, and I thought, hey, that, that's a cool thing. And now I can, in my job, say, hey, give me a build node that has PHP 5.6 running and center command 5 and HHVM. And those Jenkins will calculate which build nodes um, are in, in the pool of the available ones, and then just pick one of those. Um, still, you have to maintain that list, but that's a different story. That's a different pain point. Great. Um, and then we have to define the environment variables. So um, what the developers do locally, um, the build nodes need to do as well. Um, define composer user and composer pass. Um, spoiler, these are not the values that we use in our production environment. Uh, right, then we, went, then we configure our integration test build job. <clears throat> we give it a name. And we restrict it to this one box, project-1-int.log. Um, so it just runs on that particular host. First and, for uh, first and foremost, uh, we, comp co uh, we copy the composer.json file um, with the GitHub OAuth token from the master to the build nodes. Uh, we could have used Puppet to do that, but we don't have any Puppet layout for the build nodes. So I was looking for another way and found this uh, Jenkins plugin called the config file provider plugin that does exactly that which is pretty cool because now I have one central location uh, to manage that file, it's in Jenkins. It's a bit stupid because for every job run, the file will be copied, but that's like three or four K, so I don't care. Um, right. So first and, for, first and foremost, uh, we do validate the composer.json file. Turns out I suck at editing JSON files. Um, we, in the past, we had a few libraries that did not provide code, so there were no unit tests and, and such, um, which means that Jenkins ran fine, triggered the status job, and then static exploded. Like, whoa, I can't read the configuration file. Oh, damn, crap. I need to do, any, uh, I need to do something about it. Um, so we do validate the composer.json file on every job run, just to make sure that everything works fine. Um, then we run the security checks. So uh, most of you probably do know that uh, Sensio Labs has the security checker web service where they um, 
have a list of, of packages or package versions that have issues according to these, um, to these public uh, bug tracking uh, libraries, whatnot. Um, and you can post the composer.log file to, to, that, to that service, and then you get a list of errors back. Um, I built a small thing, thing task to communicate with that, with that service, and this is exactly what we invoke. Um, so to, just to figure out if anything is good or not. Um, and then we do run the, the bootstrapping file exactly the same way as Vagrant would do, um, passing a few options, passing the composer and user environment variables, and so Jenkins invokes Pucket, which would technically install anything that is needed. Um, downside of this is, and this is really weird, when you look at the log of the job, you will see the user and the password in clear text. I have no idea how, how Jenkins does that, but it's, it's true. So I figure out, damn, when a developer looks at that, he knows exactly our username and password. That's not what I want to do. Not that I do not trust our developers, but anyway. Um, turns out there's a solution for that. There is a Jenkins plugin called the Mask Passwords plugin. And so you can simply define a whitelist of words or whatever that should be masked, and um, so the output gets disguised. Right, so, and then we run the build. We call our CI build, uh, build target of a thing which runs code sniffer, PHP unit, pdpend, uh, all the integration tests, whatnot. And if that worked out fine, um, it communicates it back to, Jenkin, uh, to, to GitLab, which gives me like this, build passed. <clears throat> Um, and then from there, we can do the deployment, um, which is basically calling just another thing target. Um, we have app deploy dev, app deploy stage, app deploy production, um, which simply rsyncs all the local files up to the, to the server and then runs the deploy script, which does a lot of magic, um, like, uh, well, first and, foremost, first and foremost, invoking the bootstrapping file, which runs Puppet and all that stuff, um, and does a lot of backupping and, and things and the like, and then redirecting some links. And that's it. Um, yeah, so I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs> I know this was a lot of information. Do you have any questions? Yes. Which tools have you tried in the past which are now no longer part of your tool chain? So what were the dead ends of things you've looked at that didn't work out? Too many to remember. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, actually not that much. So, m yeah, not, actually, none. <laughs> Let me think, none, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's probably it, yeah. But maybe one or two plugins that I just don't recall, but more or less none. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Come on, challenge the German over here. <laughs> Hi, do, do you I, have any uh, experience with Ansible um, in a setup similar to this? Uh, to be fair, not at all, no. So we stick to Puppet, we have a few issues with that, but the pain is not so big that I would migrate, mostly because we spend a lot of time or we invested a lot of time into this whole Puppet setup to make things up and running. Um, that's why I don't switch, even though Ansible sounds pretty cool or, or Salt sounds pretty cool. Yeah, so I, I have no personal experience with that. Anyone else in the back? Hi, um, you're talking about building all your boxes from scratch and storing the right. base boxes locally. Um, we've ended up creating base boxes of our own from a generic base box and storing them locally. Have you <coughs> tried that approach and did you have a positive or negative experience either way? Um, well, we haven't built a base box completely from scratch, but I took like one I found on, on one of these sites and customized it and used that as like the base box for all of our projects right now. Yeah. So do you build on top of that box quite extensively to get to a point where you're ready to, to use it, or do you...? Well, we don't install that much tools. Like, 
Mostly we install tools like Java, which is like really big to download, and I want, do not want to download it all, over the, all the time. Um, and some other tools we, we need, like Puppet is installed on this, on this box, and some other tools. So we don't install that many tools. We try to make it as broadly as possible, because we have so many different projects, I don't want to install too many different parts of, of the software on, on this machine. Okay, thanks. Cool. <clears throat> uh, I have two questions, actually. Uh, sure. So the first one is, what type of file sharing do you use between the host and the virtual machine? File sharing? File sharing, okay. type of file sharing. Um, so we use the default one, which is, I, I don't know what, the Samba one, I think, is it? Um, that can be really slow, I know. Um, so especially if you do a lot of front-end work, I had issues convincing my front-end developers that this is still a good thing. Um, we tried the rsync one, which, which comes with, uh, with Vagrant, which um, works pretty good, but over time gets really slow, or got really slow back in the past. I found a plugin called the Gatling rsync plugin, um, that seemed to work pretty good, but we, I think we don't use it in product, uh, well, in, in development right now. <clears throat> yeah, okay. but yeah. this is really a pain point, yeah. Okay, and the second question is, uh, have you thought about using Docker instead of Vagrant? Uh, and that, mm. at least in Linux instances, it would uh, mm. face the, the performance issue. Well, that's actually a thing that I want to do this year. Um, <clears throat> turns out we had this build pipeline stuff finished in like 2013 and it was running and we had no issues anymore. And then I was at OSCON and this guy presented Docker and I thought, holy crap, I need to throw that stuff away and <laughs> use Docker. Um, so I had to wait a bit <laughs> just to make sure my, my developers are able to, <laughs> to cope with change again. Um, this is actually something that I want to do this year, yeah. So we have our own Docker instance in production right now, which is the GitLab stuff. So this is completely powered by Docker. So that just gives us a few ideas on how to run that stuff. And I want to also use that locally. Because technically, this is stupid what we do. Um, because we, come on, it is. Yeah, yeah, back and forth. Um, like, we don't have like a build artifact, right? So Jenkins runs a build on a Git tag. And over here, someone just arsyncs his local stuff on, on the production servers. Um, it never never something went wrong, let <laughs> me put it that way. Um, but still, it, it, feels, it feels wrong, right? I, I, I want to, uh, reproduce, to have a reproducible package that I know that Jenkins is, is happy with and the developers are happy with and that I can easily push in production. So this, this has to come, yeah. So my, I might be back next year showing you how to use Docker in that, in that case. Anyone else? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Are you using Satis to proxy third-party libraries that you didn't create yourself <clears throat> for speed? Mm -hmm. um, since a few weeks, yes, specifically, specifically for Magento. So we had a few Magento projects, and we just pull in their status or their whatever they use into our own service. Um, we don't use it for any other packages because it's quite hard to maintain. Let me put it that way, because you have to edit the composer, the, the status configuration every single time, and we use so many different packages that it just does not make any sense to, to edit that. So this is really a point where, where, where the Tora and proxy solution would, would come into handy, because that stuff does the caching automatically in the background. So that would be the only, only pro point for us uh, for, this, for the switch. Anyone else? No one? Okay, cool. So, last but not least, uh, if you enjoyed the talk, please rate it. Um, I'm not sure if I will do it again, but still, feedback is good. Um, I gave you my experience, you give me your ratings. Um, this is how we do. Uh, yeah, this is how we roll. Uh, so, thank you very much for having me. <laughs>